the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Well, is there anything that isn't blowing up? Is there anything that isn't falling apart? Western civilization, Eastern civilization, shutdowns all over the globe for whatever purpose you can imagine. Well, we've got a lot to talk about this week on with John Rubino, dollarcollapse.com. John, this thing in Japan really has potential to drag everything down, doesn't it? Hey, Carrie. Yeah, you know, Japan, in a world of big stories, Japan might be the big story because, um, okay, here, here's the background. They, they had their gigantic financial bubble way back in the 1990s. And they responded just as other governments responded to more recent financial bubbles bursting by basically bailing everybody inside out, creating as much new currency as, as was necessary to do that, and then pushing interest rates down to um, um, historically incredibly low levels. So they've basically been uh, just kind of a, a zombie country staggering along uh, with negative interest rates, massive government deficits, um, and slow growth. And which is, you know, that's it's not fine. You can't say that's fine, but uh, you can survive in that form for quite a while as long as your interest rates stay down. As soon as interest rates go up, then um, the cost of all that government debt and, and Japan is now, um, in terms of its per capita government debt, the most indebted country in the history of the human race. So if their interest rates go up, their government's budget explodes and the country goes bankrupt. Um, so what has happened lately is the, uh, the Japanese central bank has pegged the interest rates on government bonds at some really low level and offered to buy as many government bonds as it takes to keep that yield way down there at an easily manageable level. And they're, they're doing that with the 10 year right now at 0.25%. Uh, which is higher than it has been in the past. That was a negative yielding bond for a long time. Uh, but the market is fighting back even against that low yield peg by dumping a lot of bonds saying, okay, you want to buy them at, the, at this price? Here they are. And, and so the Japanese central bank has been having trouble maintaining that peg. Now, why this is important is that uh, if they lose control of the market, in other words, if they can't control interest rates on their bonds, um, then everybody's just going to give up. Bond yields will spike, the government will go bankrupt, and the uh, you know Japan becomes the first domino to fall in terms of major countries that, that go bust. Um, so this is a, an important thing to watch. And right now, they're within their range. The, the yield on the 10-year is slightly less than 0.25%. But over the past week, it's gotten as high as 0.45%. Um, because people have been just handing in as many bonds as the bank could buy. And what, what might happen pretty soon is that the, uh, the Bank of Japan ends up buying all the bonds that are issued by the, the um, Japanese government, which means we're completely into modern monetary theory. Range then, you know, yeah, we're just completely monetizing the debt of the, the government with newly created currency. Uh, and, and, you know, we can't know how all this is going to play out, but we're... Uh, we're a couple of steps down the road to the worst case scenario. So this definitely bears watching. Just watch the uh, the Japanese 10-year treasury on CNBC, and that'll give you an idea of what the rest of the world is doing at any given time. Well, I got a question for you, John. How many central bankers does it take to stop a global depression? An infinite number once it gets going. You, they, they won't be able to stop it at some point. <laughs> Nobody because, knows because it's never been done. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, um, what's happening now is that um, all the world's central bank, the major central banks, are trying to tighten um, to, to head off inflation, which is looking double digit in a lot of countries, which is a crisis level of inflation. But stock prices have already tanked. You know, we're in a uh, in or close to bear market levels um, in equities in most of the major countries, which means for the first time in our adult lifetimes, the central banks are raising interest rates and otherwise tightening into an equities bear market. And usually an equities bear market was the thing that told them to switch gears and start loosening. But they can't do that because of inflation this time. So they're in that box that everybody kept saying, oh, the Fed's in a box and the, and the box is getting smaller. Well, 
they're they're there now they're in a tight little box where no matter what they do it risks global financial crisis and um you know they cause they set this fire so it's it's their job to put it out but it's apparently impossible to fix what's happened so far and so the next couple of years or maybe even just the next couple of months we'll see uh the big story is going to be central banks trying to fix the unfixable and a growing number of people coming around to the point of view that it's unfixable and acting accordingly so financial chaos is is what you get in that kind of situation and we're headed that way fast maybe jim rickards is right maybe we're gonna have to revalue gold to stabilize the global financial system but with all the currency units created what price could you possibly it would be a hundred thousand dollars an ounce at, uh, well, at this rate well the guys who run the numbers um for the monetary reset and for us going back to some kind of a gold standard um usually come up with ten to twenty thousand dollars an ounce for gold as as a number that allows us to fully back the big fiat currencies um i'll take that that would be enough as a gold bug <laughs> to to call it you know to call it a good um strategy to be stacking all these years but um it you know it could be considerably higher like you said we're continuing to increase the amount of fiat currency in the world which means the uh, the target number for gold backing in terms of gold's price goes up from here every day that we continue to to dump more currency into the markets um, so the longer they wait the more wrenching the um the process of getting back to a sustainable um manageable um monetary system that allows us to go forward without crisis after crisis after crisis the price gets higher and uh, it, we should have done it 20 years ago we really should have done it 10 years ago. And if we could do it now, that would be the best deal that we're going to get because it's only going to get worse. Wow. You know, it's, uh, you can't even picture the world after everything gets revalued in accordance with gold. And I, I don't see anything else they can use. Look, uh, these, these highfalutin cleptocurrencies, they're all in the toilet. I mean, Bitcoin nailed the peaks in 17 and in, uh, and last year, uh, but it's down. It crashed below its 2017 peak of 19,700. There, it's just look out below. We always said uh, currencies, whether it's fiat or otherwise, rely upon confidence. It looks like uh, the confidence in Bitcoin uh, doesn't seem to be there anymore, does it, John? Yeah. Well, Bitcoin in particular in cryptos in general trade like tech stocks they're they're very similar to the dot-com bubble of the 1990s which um you know which isn't to say that it's a bogus concept because after the dot-com bubble uh, a lot of the survivors went on to be amazon and ebay and and lots of other companies that are still around and who are still highly valuable uh, so it could be that uh, crypto turns out to have a, a role in a future monetary system um and some of the major cryptocurrencies end up being much more valuable than they are today but um you see what's possible when you treat something like a tech stock uh, you get the whole universe of them just crashing when people start to lose confidence uh, so that's what's happened to um to cryptos in the last few weeks we've seen just a, a, a exodus and what's different this time see that that's normal for bitcoin it's it's gone way up and gone way down and gone way up and gone way down three or four times where where people write it off and say oh bitcoin is dead and then it comes back to some new high after that and we're keeping with that pattern right now um mm -hmm. the big di difference this time being a lot of new capital flowed into cryptos in this past cycle and a lot of new leverage was applied to different crypto products you know there are a lot of things out there um in the crypto space that are, are basically banks they don't call themselves banks they use different words for deposits and exchanges. loans and things like that yeah that hold yeah stuff for you kind of like uh, going back to what banks used to do they would hold the gold so you didn't have to carry it around with you and issue script so here you just park your uh, your well, coins but, at the exchange but care the, the original banks back before fractional reserve banking just held it for you and you paid them a fee in return for them safeguarding your gold. Now, 
with the new generation, these these new generation of, of crypto exchanges act more like fractional reserve banking banks, except they pay crazy high interest rates. You know, you can you can get, or you could have gotten six months ago, a promise of a 17% return for um, putting your Bitcoin into some of these exchanges, which means those exchanges had to be going out. They had to go out and take extreme risks in order to generate that kind of a return. They were arbitraging effectively, right? Um, arbitraging. Ba basically, yeah, but arbitraging at extremely high levels of risk. And so now a lot of them are falling apart because, you know, there's no way they're going to keep on making 17% or they have to make maybe 20% in order to pay a 17% interest. The very notion is insane. Uh, look, Bernie Madoff ripped off half the world just guaranteeing 10%. Uh, anytime, and 10% is unsustainable over the long run, you know that. But uh, as a guaranteed return, as a risk adjusted return, Yes, there have a small portion of money managers and the mutual fund advisors, et cetera, that have hit it, the Warren Buffetts of the world, but you know, it just can't be done. So that's the first time, first indication of a Ponzi. But look at Dogecoin, like Bitcoin's doing badly, right? It's trading for a, a third of what it was, a little less than a third, so maybe 30% of what it was. Dogecoin hit a high of uh, around 32 and a half cents. It's now at six cents. And it just shows what uh, I think it was Peter Lynch always said it, said the dumb money isn't dumb until it listens to the smart money. <laughs> so, okay, well, so, so right? the question now is who's highly leveraged in Dogecoin out there, right? And what's gonna happen to them? And then multiply that by all the other um, cryptocurrencies out there. And you get the potential for kind of a cascade failure of sections of the crypto space. Uh, and we can't know ahead of time who that's going to be because we really don't know where all the leverage is in this market. It's not, um, it's mm -hmm. not as clear even as the banking system, which is very opaque. So probably over the next few months, unless Bitcoin just shoots right back up to 30 or 40,000. Uh, we're going to see a lot of surprise bankruptcies. And, you know, one, one interesting story in this space is Michael Saylor, who um, a, a lot of your viewers probably know about already, but he's, he's a guy who runs a, um, a public company. And he decided Bitcoin was going to be the next big thing. So he loaded up using his company's money on Bitcoin. And then he borrowed against his uh, company's treasury to buy more Bitcoin. And now he's, um, you know, he made massive profits, became a billionaire. His company was a tech stock darling. And now it's all reversing out. And the question is, what happens to an entity like that that holds a lot of Bitcoin when they get a margin call? Do they have to dump all their Bitcoin in order to cover the margin? And then does that push the price down even further and set off a new round of margin calls? You know, are we looking at something like that? We don't know, but we could be. So the crypto space is definitely worth watching going forward because it's still worth a trillion dollars in, in market cap, just about, which means the, the damage could be very big numerically if a lot of these guys start failing. Uh, Warren Buffett again, uh, you don't know who's uh, swimming naked until the tide goes out. Uh, look, in every economic crash, there are these uh, mega companies that blow up. We've seen it over and <coughs> over and over again. Uh, so we're going to have it here. The speculation is like, which one's going to blow up? Because liquidity has been like a hose, right? They've just been spraying liquidity for the past 14 years. 13, 14 years, just in ever increasing amounts. And then the pandemic really put it into hyperdrive. So all of that liquidity covers up a lot of problems. You know, it's a, a Joe Pesci said in the, in that movie Casino, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of holes in the desert and a lot of those holes solved a lot of problems. <laughs> you know, just uh, when in doubt, just spray more liquidity into the system. If still in doubt, spray still more and never stop. And now, ostensibly, if you believe Powell, and he's in making the initial feint, I believe, right? Pulling out the spigot, 
shutting the spigot off. Next thing, they're going to start uh, uh, reducing the Fed's balance sheet with QT. I'll believe that when I see it. I believe at some point he has to pivot. So one person uh, I was speaking with said he admitted that he's just raising rates. So later on when he has to, he can cut them. So he has more ammunition, more arrows in his quiver. I kind of like that explanation, John. Well, they've been trying to do that for decades. The Fed has has kind of taken baby steps in terms of raising interest rates. And, and part of the reason for that was to give them ammo during the next crisis to cut rates. But they could never get to more than like two or three a quarter point increases before the stock market tanked. And they had to go back to easing. So it's been a downward ratchet in terms of interest rates, where, you know, one third of the um, the sovereign debt in the world was negative yielding at one point in this cycle, that, which means they've ratcheted all the way down to negative interest rates. Um, and so the question is, how much further can the Fed raise interest rates before it really breaks the financial markets? Because we're already in as bad a shape in the stock market as we were when they caved last time around. Uh, in late 2018, they tried to raise interest rates. Stock market went down by 20% and they, they totally reversed the course. Well, stocks are down that much now, but because of inflation, they don't feel like they can do their pivot yet. So we're, we're liable to see another two or three months of 50 basis points increase in the Fed fund rates, which would still be wildly inadequate for near double digit inflation. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's not clear how this plays out because inflation is a wild card that, that changes everything. So you can't use recent history as a perfect guide because recent history didn't include, um, you know, gas at six or seven bucks a gallon and oil $115 a barrel and, and food prices up near double digit rate. You know, there was nothing like that in the past. And so now they've got this overriding concern, which is even more important than the level of the stock market. So they might inflict a lot of pain before they feel like they have the right to stop. And, uh, and if so, we're just at the beginning of that process. Yeah, we're just at the beginning. And man, uh, can't even, it's just unfathomable uh, because, right? Gary, it, in, but inevitable. This was always going to happen. We were always yeah. heading this way. But this always seemed like that, that um, you know, predict, make the prediction, but don't predict the timing of it kind of thing, because who knows yeah. when it was going to happen. But um, we're getting close now. I mean, this is uh, this is the kind of stuff that is the the beginning of the um, the gold bug libertarian sound money community scenario of the end of fiat currency and fractional reserve banking. So hold on to your, your hats. Uh, this might be fascinating. Hold on um, to your lots wallet. of fun for, <laughs> yeah, lots of fun for shorts, probably a lot of fun for gold bugs and a nightmare for absolutely everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, it's just amazing what's going on here. Uh, you always knew, like you said, it was going to happen. I just hope that uh, my kids would have to deal with it instead of me, but uh, I guess that's not going to be the case. Uh, hey, on other happy news, electricity shortages. Now, I just did a, a bit, and I'm going to be having a special guest on to explain why ele electricity rates are set to double in the next 18 months, but we got these heat waves going on in the U.S., South, Midwest. I mean, it's... Uh, it's bad news out there. Yeah, well, well, th this is for the when it rains, it pours file. You know, we've got geopolitics going crazy. It's Russia-Ukraine war cutting off all these supplies of everything to the world. And we've got the financial markets getting more and more volatile. And uh, you would hope we would have at least nice weather, right? While all this is going on. But instead, we get massive, what do they call them? Heat domes or something yeah, like heat that. Heat domes. That's what heat domes. Yeah, I never heard of such a thing. Do you ever hear of a heat dome before? It, it's a new that's thing. Like, uh, uh, you, what do they call that? The bomb. The, um, you know. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, they're, they're pulling out some storm. scary, um, yeah, bomb storm or something like that. But anyhow, they're pulling out some scary terminology for some literally very scary phenomena out there, and um, the the problem with massive heat waves is among many other things is they screw up agriculture 
-hmm. And this is coming at a time when we already have broken supply chains all over the world and shortages of all kinds of stuff that go into next year's planting or next year's harvest, this year's planting. And um, we were going to have food shortages and massive increases in food prices, even if the weather was perfect. But instead, we've got droughts everywhere and, and 110 degrees um, killing off crops and things like that. And out west, you know, uh, look up Lake Powell and oh, what's the other big lake out there? Lake Mead. Lake Mead um, that are getting, they're, they're shrinking to the point where the, the water level is dropping below the level of the pipes, which take water out of the lakes and irrigate all the farms mm -hmm. in the west. So when the water level drops to the point where there's no more water for farmers, that whole agricultural sector, you know, California is one of the bread baskets of the country, but that kind of goes away. And we're, we're not all that far in terms of water levels in these big lakes from that one more bad drought year. And you'll be hearing about, uh, you know, a so dust bowl bodies. in California. Yeah, they'll find more bodies in Lake Mead. They've already found two bodies that were dumped by the mob. <laughs> and, hey, I, well, I tell you, tell you what, it's a good thing there's not a drought in New Jersey or someplace, right? Because uh, what they would find at the bottom of those bodies of water would be just uh, hair raising. Yeah, well, they had the meadowlands and they used to just dump people there. And then uh, the landfills were over them. And then they all got developed into luxury housing. But that's good point. Another okay. Another day. Hey, so speaking of inflation, Guess who just raised prices yet again? Tesla. Oh raised yeah. Between two and six thousand dollars. Five thousand on a Model S, six thousand on a Model X, two thousand on a Model Three, and everywhere in between. And obviously things are getting more expensive, but they were the genius of electric vehicles. They've locked in all of their commodity costs, or a large percentage of them by doing long-term contracts with uh, resource countries and suppliers. So they locked in, I think, um, lithium's like 50, 60,000 a ton. They locked it in at 15,000 a ton. So they were smarter than everyone. So now inflation really is a godsend for big companies because they their costs they have more control over than smaller businesses so they get to like keep their costs relatively low but they get to cash in on the fact that inflationary expectations lead consumers to uh to resist rising prices less yeah well when you when you hedge your raw material costs you pay more than the spot price normally so you take a chance the prices are going to be higher in the future uh because if if not you're paying too much compared to your competitors. But uh, yeah, Tesla, to the extent that they hedge themselves, did right. Um, but pretty much every other cost is also going up. So to the extent that they need electricity, it's more expensive. Their their mm -hmm. workforce once raises. And, and uh, nobody's completely avoiding inflation. And that's been the big theme of this last earnings season when um, when company after company came out and said, okay, you know, we, we, our sales are up, but our costs are up even more. So our margins are being squeezed. So earnings next year won't be as high as this year. You know, that's, that's the story over and over again. And um, that's, that's the case out there. And that means companies are going to have to raise prices to the extent that they can, you know, everybody's going to have to do a Tesla if they can get away with it by raising prices in order to offset increasing costs. Uh, which, which is just to say that uh, commodity cost increases are being passed through to consumers by corporations, mm -hmm. which means politics is going to go crazy in the U.S. because stagflation is the worst possible environment in which to run for re-election. So this, uh, this upcoming midterms election in the U.S. is going to be brutal. Like if they had it today, it would be just a nightmare for incumbents. Uh, and there's not really anything on the horizon that looks like it can fix that. Um, but there's also not anything on the horizon that looks like it's going to stop price increases anytime soon. You know, this is the kind of thing that, uh, except inventories are going up for a lot of retailers and they're having to blow a lot of inventory out. So, so there are some 
early deflationary forces at work here, but they're they're in the minority right now. Most of the stuff that's going on is still inflationary and will be so for a while before things turn. So true. Yeah. I mean, I was at Target the other day. The the store shelves are stocked full. I mean, it's all anecdotal. Obviously, by their own admissions, they're having problems uh, with turning over inventory because all a merchant does is trades uh, cash for goods and then trades goods for cash. That's what they do. They trade. And when they can't trade the goods that they've accumulated quickly enough for cash, they quickly run into problems. Uh, outfits like Target, like... Um, like Walmart historically turned over their goods extremely quickly um, and therefore have made a lot of profits. Declining stores you always see, like declining retailers publicly traded, their turnover of inventory, how many times in a year they sell their existing inventory. So if, it's, if their sales are seven billion and they got a uh, billion dollars worth of inventory, they turned it seven times, right? Those measures always belie sick or ailing retailers. And now they're all getting hit by it, John. Well, what, what's happening is people are having to pay way up to put gas in their car. They're having to pay way up at the grocery store. Rents are going through the roof. That's good. And for that's leaving a lot. Though. John, that's great for retail sales. <laughs> yeah, when you when you pay twice as much for gas, that increases GDP. Yeah, yeah, it's a good uh, thing. <laughs> but it but it's not leaving all that much for Target and, and um, Costco and Walmart, and yeah, so well, they're they're, they're dealing with excess inventories right now. But the reason for that is that prices are so much higher for other things that they don't sell. But that will soon reverse when people realize that inflation is here to stay. And that if they don't buy today, it's going to be more money tomorrow. I did this myself. Plus, you might not be able to get that other item fixed. So you're better off with the new item and get a warranty on it. I mean, I didn't really want a new mixer. They just came out. Roadcaster just came out with a new one. Probably could do the show without one, but I like toys. And I said, you know, I'll just sell the old one on eBay. I'll buy the new one. And uh, at least I'll have a warranty for another year. And it's just going to be more money later on. I'll get more money for my old one than I would have gotten. Inflation starts getting baked into the cake, the expectations. And then the so-called crack-up boom is upon us, right? Yeah. Once people start panic buying everything they're going to need for the next two years, that pushes the price of stuff up in the moment which causes more people to panic and so on. And, and there's really no end to that until everybody completely runs out of money and the system crashes. So yeah, that's the crack up boom. But you'll have and toilet paper and paper towels to, for the next two years. I mean, I just went out, I usually bulk buy because I just hate running out of stuff. And I bought a case of toilet paper, a case of uh, paper towels, Bounty, um, a giant thing of... Uh, of laundry detergent pods and one other thing. And I paid like 120 something dollars for all this stuff. And I, I just could not believe that it cost that much. So it's already happening. Yeah, yeah, it is, is definitely already happening. And uh, we'll see over the next six months if it continues in that direction or if the economy just crashes because everybody runs out of money. Uh, I, I'd say they're equally possible scenarios right now. And we could have both conceivably. It could go really to the end and then crash and then, you know, deflationary depression, which all of them are eventually. Um, really interesting. Well, how many uh, central bankers can it take to uh, stop a global depression? And answer is uh, zero because nobody can do anything. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're almost at the point where they just throw up their hands and say, look, the market is going to take care of this. There's nothing we can do. And, uh, you know, I, you don't want to feel too much schadenfreude when something like that happens because it, it, it really ruins a lot of people's lives. So it's not something to laugh about. No. But it is going to be funny. <laughs> When these guys who were like gods in the financial world for such a long time, when they were clearly 
um, non-entities. You know, they didn't know what they were doing. All they were doing was handed money to people, you know, the easiest thing in the world. And they were, they were um, lauded as these economic geniuses. And, and, and to see them completely crash and burn is going to be poetic justice for sure. And their behavior as they crash and burn is going to be hilarious. But the, the end result of that is going to be a lot of human suffering. So we, we have to keep it in perspective, even as our stock market shorts are um, going through the roof and, uh, and our gold mining stocks are hitting new records. You know, we're, we're going to have to um, remember that the flip side of that is that a lot of regular people who trusted the people in charge um, are going to be hurt badly by this because there, there's no way if you're um, a regular person with um, you keep your savings in the bank, you have a gas guzzling car, you've got a big house because you were supposed to get those things because everything was super cheap when you financed it. You know, if you're one of those people, there's no way you get out of this unscathed. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. In any event, that's it for this week. Uh, tune in in two weeks. We'll be back. Make sure you go over to John's site, dollarcollapse.com. Sign up for both our newsletters. Any questions for John, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. John, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. See you, Kerry.